to remove a couple statues of Confederate president and a Confederate general who's a Ku Klux Klan leader from their city. The state had made it illegal for them to do that, but they found a loophole to do it because obviously these statues were a bit troubling for the people of Memphis. Fifty years ago, after Martin Luther King was killed, President Lyndon B. Johnson immediately signed in the Fair Housing Act law in an attempt to eliminate segregation in our country. But 50 years later, multiple studies have shown that the United States are nearly as segregated as they were when LBJ signed that law to eliminate it. We live in a we live in a world where most of the Jim Crow segregation laws um, have been to to, to segregate and separate have been removed from the books, but are still hanging on in parts and ways that things are carried out practice in our own very united states. And in the last 10 years, racial tension has greatly increased, hasn't it? Violence, um, riots, shootings, we see it in elections. We're building a law to separate countries. We're living in fear of peoples. Unfortunately, racism and segregation is alive and well today. It's, it's worse. Um, it's worse, though, when it's in churches, isn't it? Um, last summer, we were in Memphis, and we noticed that every church had a picture of its pastor outside from the church, and every billboard advertising a church had always the picture of the pastor. We asked why. We were told why. Because that's how you can tell if it's a white church or a black church. Fact, over 90% of churches in the United States today are segregated. Now this has been, um, it's sad that that race could, that race could divide or, or keep us from loving and uniting with people that we must. It's it's sad that, that anything, really, um, income level, age, gender, could divide God's people. But it's been happening for uh, a long time. Is that up there? Sorry. All right. There you go. There's a picture of the just the idea of, as you drive around Memphis. Um, what goes on there. It's been happening for a long time. It's been happening for a long time. Um, even since Cain and Abel had their thing and then Cain went off and now lived in fear of anyone who is different from him. But the big one was in the Tower of Babel where people's languages were confused. And from that point on, that's how you have different nations, different races, different cultures, different peoples. And from there on out, that changed the world um, more than the flood changed the world. Then you had Abraham's sons, Isaac and Ishmael. From Isaac, the, the Jewish people came. From Ishmael, the Arab people came. And Jews and Arabs are still fighting and hating each other today. You have, throughout the Bible, you have Jews and Gentiles. Jews, God's chosen people. Gentiles, anyone who isn't a Jew. Anyone who isn't one of God's chosen people for that. The assignment of bringing the Messiah into the world um, at each other's throats. You have the development of slavery, which is really contained and, and, and related to a horrible and wrong thought that one race or one nation or one group of people could be inferior to others. And that led into the Holocaust where you have the horrible and wrong thought that one nation or one race could be superior to others. That, that one race could be pure and others impure. And then it leads right up into the race riots that you have going on um, today in our country. The inequalities that exist among various races and even in 
churches that are homogeneous, one race. And finally, just in our own lives and hearts. Just our own unwillingness to reach out, to love people who are different than us, to see, to look at the face of our enemy and see our brother. Well, racism and segregation was alive and well in Jesus' day, too. You can see it in the laws that the Jews made for themselves to keep separate from Samaritans, to keep separate from Gentiles. You can see it, um, they, they, it, it was against their law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. And, and Jews, Jews looked at non-Jews or Gentiles as being unclean or impure. So our first point is this. We shouldn't consider anyone impure or unclean. We shouldn't consider anyone impure or unclean. And so we're going to look at this story today, that big long text I read, because this is the story where God teaches us this. This is how God taught his first followers, uh, followers of Christ, and this is how God teaches us how important this is. So the gospel was spreading. Um, it was going out, as Acts 1, 8 said, that from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. The disciples were carrying out that mission Jesus gave them. And now it was just going to begin to cross ethnic lines, beginning with an Italian Gentile, a centurion in the Roman army, army named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius and his family were fearers of God. They were God-fearers. It doesn't mean they were necessarily Christian. It means that he had rejected Roman paganism. He had rejected Roman polytheism, all the different gods the, that his Roman nation worshipped. And he was worshipping the one true God. He, he believed in God. He prayed to God. He gave to the poor out of his faith in God. But he still needed Jesus. And even though he was this God-fearing people who had the respect of Jewish people for the good things he did in their community because of his faith in the one God, he still would have been considered unclean by them because he wasn't living according to the ceremonial laws. So an angel comes to Cornelius' house and tells him to send some men to Joppa to get a man named Simon Peter from Simon the Tanner's house. So as those men are on the way to Peter's house, Peter has a vision too. And in Peter's vision, a sheet comes down from heaven filled with all kinds of clean and unclean animals. And Peter's hungry there in the afternoon. So God says to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. So just, just to put that in our own, so I want you to imagine you are an animal rights loving vegan, okay? And a blanket comes down, not only filled with some fruit and vegetables for you, but some hamburgers, some sausages, some T-bone steaks, some prime ribs, some pork chops. How are you going to feel about that? So I want you to notice something that there was a mix of clean and unclean animals in there. That was something that was forbidden directly in Leviticus chapter 11. But now you have them mixed up, clean and unclean animals. And the voice comes to Peter and says, get up, kill and eat. The Lord says that to him. And Peter says, no way. He says, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Hey, wait, is this the old Peter now? Remember, um, you know, the one who, when Jesus said, we got to go to Jerusalem, and Peter says, surely not, Lord. And then he calls him Satan. Is it that old Peter? Or is this the new Peter, the bold Peter, but maybe just too bold? I don't know, but either way, he doesn't, he does oppose God there. He says, surely not. Um, so, as he has to do so often with Peter, um, God repeats it three times, you know. Three times Peter denies. Three times the Lord has to assure him he's forgiven. So there's a lot of this going on with Peter. So three times this message comes again, again with Peter, to get the point through to him. And here's the point. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Anything. So not just food, Peter. People. There are still people that you are considering unclean and impure. And the sheet had mixed animals on it. They were mixed together. Wasn't the Lord teaching us something about racism here? Isn't it time for different peoples to be mixed together? 
So while Peter was letting that sink in, some some unclean no, not unclean, some Gentiles came from Cornelius' house, knocked on his door. They ended up taking him to Cornelius' house where Cornelius has a bunch of relatives and friends gathered together. Now, that would have been a mixed crowd there because Cornelius' his relatives would have been Gentiles, but some of his close friends could certainly have been Jews with the respect he had in that community. And Peter brought some Jewish Christians, um, believers, along with him. So you have this now mixed company, and Peter walks into that Gentile house which would have made him, according to their laws, which would have made him unclean. And he says to them, you are all well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So Peter got the point of what God was telling him. Have we? Have we? I mean, surely we who who have been freed by Christ from the burden of the ceremonial Old Testament law, surely we have no reason to regard any um, race or nation or social class as unclean or unfit for fellowship in the church. And, and yet the church has always been threatened by divisions, divisions among race, among um, income level, among gender, among age, and, and on and on. There's so many things that have divided the church. God's powerful words, his powerful words to Peter opened Peter's mind to the bigness of God's church. God was about to bring young and old, men and women, black and white, rich and poor, together as one, one community of faith. Can't God do that today, too? Well, as Cornelius then, then tells Peter, okay, we are all here in the presence of God, and we're ready to listen. Whatever it is that God has in mind for you to tell us. So Peter says, he, he gets up and he starts kind of a whole sermon. He starts it with this. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. So then Peter really walks through a, a whole wonderful sermon again. And the main point of it, the theme of it is this, that peace, the true peace, especially between you know, enemies, between people who've been divided, true peace comes through only through the good news of Jesus. This is the peace that brings peace among us. So Jesus, the, the Son of God, he, he came here. He, he lived among us. He taught us. He showed us by example. He, he taught us. He healed people. He did all kinds of good. But yet they crucified him. His enemies crucified him. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. And we're going out telling everyone this good news. And one day, Jesus is going to be the one who judges the living and the dead. But the scriptures, the scriptures that have been written from the beginning, all of the scriptures were pointing to him all the way along. It was always about him. He was always the one coming to do this. And now everyone who believes in him everyone who believes in him, not just one group of people, not one nation of people, everyone who believes in him will receive the forgiveness of their sin in his name. So, our second point is that God accepts people from every race who have faith in him. That, that powerful gospel message that Peter preached, it changed the hearts of those people. It it worked faith in the hearts of this crowd. The Holy Spirit showed up there in a very powerful way. It, our text says that the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples, and that was the same word used in Acts 2, where he fell upon the disciples, and he gave them the tongues of fire and the sound of wind and everything. The Holy Spirit here fell on those people who were present and gave them all kinds of signs and wonders and the abilities to speak in other tongues. You had a Pentecost part two happening right there in Cornelius' house. And yeah, it blew away um, the Jewish Christians who were there to see that even even the Holy Spirit is even being poured out on the Gentiles like this. And then you had a mass baptism. Cornelius' his family, his friends. And so you have many different peoples added into God's family on that day through faith in Jesus. 
And then they hung out together for a while. They, they rejoiced in this. They, they celebrated together. Then you get into chapter 11. And chapter 11 is, it's kind of funny in kind of a non-funny way. So here's what happens. After all this wonderful story happens in chapter 10. In chapter 11, some Jewish Christians 65 miles away back in Jerusalem heard about what happened and they rejoiced. No. They heard about what happened and they criticized Peter. They said, you went in the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? <laughs> That's shocking to us, isn't it? Right? You know, or is it? Have you ever, have you ever been in the situation where you found yourself like talking to, let's say, an older, an older person, quite older person, and who just a God-loving, God-fearing older person who you have a lot of respect for, but then all of a sudden you hear kind of a, a racist comment or a racist word come out of their mouth, and you're kind of like, what? And then you realize that they're from a generation or two generations or three generations ago, and the thought hits you that it shows, it this kind of shows how far we've come. But then you just go watch the news or see what's happening in the world today and the thought hits you again. That shows you how far we have yet to go. Right? So, so I, I think there's some aspects of this segregation or racial or, or this, this where we treat other people who are different from us as enemies that when we look at others doing go like, how could you do that? And yet there's just still some things that even live in the hearts of wonderful God-fearing people, ourselves included. Okay, I said this chapter was kind of funny in a non-kind of funny way. Well, here's the funny thing. After God made Cornelius a Christian, in chapter 10, right? This is chapter 11. After God made Cornelius a Christian, the church gathered to decide whether or not God could do that. I mean, isn't that hilarious? That God made Cornelius a Christian and his whole family, and then the church has a meeting, they have a gathering to decide whether or not God is able to do that or whether or not God is permitted to do that. I find that kind of funny. So um, then, so they ask Peter, they're grilling Peter now, and Peter tells the whole story, what happened, kind of word for word, that's what a lot of chapter 11 is about, and, and he underlines for them how the Holy Spirit told them to have no hesitation about going to the Gentiles. And Peter says, so, if God gave them the same gift that he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? You know, like he started opposing him when the when the Lord first started speaking to him in the vision, um, which was kind of funny as well. Um, but now Peter realizes how serious and how dangerous it is to oppose God. So the point there is that racism and dividing ourselves from those who are different is opposing God. And when they heard this, our text says, they quieted down. So apparently it had been loud in there. Apparently there had been some rumblings. But when they heard that, they quieted down. And then they praised God. Then um, the church agreed. Yeah, God has even given salvation to the Gentiles. So yes, we guess God is able to do that. So good thing, good thing that God got the church's agreement of what he can do. It's a good thing that the church signed off on what God's plan was. So, if God united himself, is our third point, if God united himself with sinners, he can unite different races. Now, but when you keep on reading, in fact, if you read the very next verse, which is verse 19 in Acts chapter 11, if you read that very next verse in your Bible, you'll see that some people went out right from there to start telling people the good news about Jesus only to Jews. So they didn't get it right away. And this is something that the church has struggled with. It's something that has challenged the church throughout the ages. But if God himself doesn't show partiality in reaching out to others, then why have we? Then why has partiality been allowed to exist in our local churches today? If, if God welcomes men and women from every tribe, nation, and language into his kingdom, then why is it that the vast majority of churches in our country today are, are not likewise welcoming diverse people into the fellowship of their local congregations? 
But of course, if you talk to any church, I mean, we, we all would say, well, we welcome everyone, right? Well, although most people and the churches they attend would never intentionally turn other people away, those same people, more often than not, will do very little to intentionally invite or attract people unlike themselves to their church. So if more than 90% of the churches in our country today are segregated, can we conclude that the, that the leadership has been reluctant or unwilling or unable to change the majority culture of our local church to be one that accepts people from different uh, races or social classes or economic classes or nations? Why is this a struggle for us? Why is this... From, from the beginning to now, like, why has this been such a struggle for us as individuals, as churches? Why is it? I mean, it might be a number of things, but why is it? Is it because, um, is this a thought in our hearts? Well, because our way is the right way, not theirs. Or, we deserve this, they don't. Or, it is just a fear of, fear of things we're not used to. Or, or worse yet, fear of what others might think of us. And we can clearly see what, what God wants, right? We can clearly see what he wants us to do. So I guess as a people, let's, and maybe we saw this a little bit in the video, but can we just ask God for some forgiveness and healing? And can we ask God to do for us what he's done for these disciples in our text? Can we, can we, how can we, can God uh, do for our church what he did for their church? Here's the important thing, friends. God has united himself with you. God has united himself with you. He has forgiven you. And if God has united himself with sinners, he can unite different races and nations and groups of people. Because, friends, that is what the kingdom of God looks like. That is what heaven is going to look like. The last church I was at, we had 150 people, but there were 17 different nationalities, and we, we had fun with that, and we, we, it was kind of our imperfect picture, we thought, of imperfect, very imperfect, of what heaven is going to look like. The perfect picture of heaven is all the races and nations and peoples together as one. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. And so that must be a core value of our church. Diverse, but united. Because that is a fulfillment of what we hear in Genesis chapter 12, where God promises Abraham that all peoples and all the different nations of the world will be blessed through his son, through his seed, through the promised Messiah. That's what heaven's going to look like. All different nations, all different peoples united in Jesus. So, if you read the rest of Acts chapter 11, you would see that a church was planted in the very multicultural city of Antioch. Now, do you know where disciples of Jesus were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, Christians, um, so in Antioch, you have all kinds of diversity there. Jews, Gentiles, uh, some of everybody were there. And that's where they're first called Christians. Now, Christian can mean all kinds of different things today. Um, but back then it meant one thing. A Christian was a follower of Christ, a little Christ. Someone who trusted Christ for salvation and then strove to live in thanks by following uh, what Christ taught about and his way of living and to be Christ-like in their words and in their actions. So in other words, to as you live your life, to look like Christ. And all of that was done in thankfulness to what Jesus Christ had done by redeeming them. So Christians were people who not only loved God, but who loved one another, sought to love one another unconditionally, the way that Jesus has loved us. And so there in Antioch, you had Gentiles loving Jews. You had Jews loving Gentiles. You had all of them gathering together as one to worship God, united as one in the local church in Antioch. And yes, 
that blew everyone away. Because only the Prince of Peace could bring this kind of peace between divided groups. Only a Messiah could unite the world as one by sowing love in the hearts of people that have so often been filled with hate. Only a God, the true God, Jesus Christ, could, could turn Jews and Gentiles, different nations and languages and tribes of people, into Christians. So, it is not a coincidence that the, that the disciples were first called Christians there in Antioch. Because there, there, Jesus Christ was clearly seen in the midst of unity. Just like he said he would be. That's how he told his disciples that the world would recognize Christians. That unity they have in Christ. Because that is what Jesus looks like. So may he fill our hearts and our church and our churches with the same kind of love. May, may other people call us Christians. And may God give us the love we need for all of us to be united. Amen.